Let's look a little closer at this scripture. It almost reads like a legal contract. In fact, as Rob was reading it, I thought, oh my, he's lost his place. <laughs> he kept repeating it over and over again. So um, it seems like God wishes to leave no doubt in our minds as to what his intentions are regarding another flood to destroy the earth. And um, he, he notice the repetition. He est I establish my covenant is repeated twice. Never again will there be a flood is repeated three times in different ways. This is the sign my bow in the clouds is repeated three times. I will remember my covenant is repeated twice. And then God even said something that I felt was kind of strange for God is, I will see it to remind myself. And I thought, wow, God needs reminding. I don't think he does, but I think he said that for a reason. And that was, I want you to know for sure there's never going to be a flood again. Um, so why even bother with making this covenant? I was thinking, you know, if I was God, I would like to just leave people wondering, is there going to be another flood? Maybe you should behave better, you know? <laughs> I might do this again. So, straighten up. So, um, why the Rainbow Covenant was made, I believe, is so that Noah could leave the ark behind. I had never thought about this before until I was thinking about this sermon, but the ark was necessary for salvation of life on earth. But once the Rainbow Covenant was made, the ark was obsolete. If Noah and the animals had stayed in the ark, they eventually would die. The ark couldn't sustain them. So it was a necessary vessel, but it was only temporary. Try to imagine one of Noah's sons saying, y'all go on ahead, I'll just stay here. You know, he didn't believe the covenant, and he just wants to stay behind in the ark. He would eventually die of starvation, because the ark was not the environment that humans and the rest of the animals were intended for. So it was necessary for a time, but obsolete once its time was up. So I want to talk about some other covenants. This is, if you guys just want to do the, the slides, I'm not coordinated enough for that. The, um, the Old Covenant, some of you might be familiar with the Old Covenant, but in case you're not, God made other important covenants with men. Two of the most important and famous covenants in the Old Testament are the Abrahamic and the Mosaic one made with Abraham, one made with Moses and the nation of Israel, which I want to discuss together as the Old Covenant. It began as a covenant with Abraham and was later, at the right time, restated to be a covenant between God and the nation of Israel, represented by Moses. So let me just read this really quick so you know what it is. Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Okay, I want you to just hang on to that little statement, okay? In you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Um, Genesis 17, 1 through 11. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am the God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you, and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. You're seeing some repetition in here, I guess, too, right? Um, this is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. Okay, I need to back up just a little bit. What was the sign of the rainbow covenant? I, I may have given it away in the title there. In the <laughs> rainbow, yeah. So the rainbow was the sign of the rainbow covenant. The old covenant, what was the sign of the old covenant that I just read about between Abraham and God? Circumcision, okay? That one's not quite as visible as the rainbow. Um, 
What was promised? Prosperity, protection, greatness. I'm going to make nations out of you, he said a couple of times. And there's a foreshadowing, and that's why I mentioned that verse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This foreshadowing, I, I believe, points to the coming of Jesus through Abraham's descendants. Okay. The Mosaic Covenant um, is, I think, is just a continuation of this. It's, it's to the same group of people, um, Abraham's descendants. The Mosaic Covenant was introduced after the nation of Israel left Egypt and it added the law. It was a co continuation of the covenant with Abraham. I don't have time to go over in detail, but if you read Exodus 19 through 24, you should have a pretty good picture of it. So it's, it's very long and detailed and the law comes in all kinds of interesting laws that thankfully we're not under these days. And um, this, let's see, what was promised in this one? You shall be my treasured possession among all peoples is one of the things God promised. Um, and this was made to the nation of Israel. And the sign, um, the Ark of the Covenant is one of the signs of this newer covenant. There's actually an Ark which I find interesting because this is a word that you don't see everywhere and we just saw it twice in two different places. Um, Noah's stepping out of the ark and um, uh, Moses was told to actually build an ark to contain the tablets of the law. So there's arks involved in both of these old covenants. Okay, so the new covenant, the covenant of the cross when God paid our debt. Moving forward to the New Testament, we see God making a final covenant with us. The New Covenant. Hebrews, let me just read this to you. I think Hebrews 8, 6 through 12 describes the New Covenant very, very well. And so I'm just going to read this whole thing to you. Um, but as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is much more excellent than the old, as the covenant he mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. For he finds fault with them when he says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant, so I showed no concern for them, declares the Lord. For this is the new covenant, I'm sorry, this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach each one his neighbor, saying, Know, know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, for I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and catch this last line, and I will remember their sins no more. Okay, so what was promised in the New Covenant? Four things that I listed, and, and maybe more in here, but I just saw one, I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts. The laws had been on tablets of stone up to this point, or in scrolls, or whatever. Um, God's going to put them on our hearts. Number two, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Number three, they shall all know me. Number four, I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. I found um, the Matthew Henry commentary on this particular passage, and it says this so eloquently, so let me read to you some more. Sorry about all the reading this morning. The superior excellence of the priesthood of Christ above that of Aaron is shown from that covenant of grace of which Christ was mediator. The law not only made all subject to it liable to be condemned for the guilt of sin, but also was an unable to remove that guilt and clear the conscience from the sense and terror of it. Whereas by the blood of Christ, a full remission of sins was provided so that God would remember them no more. God once wrote his laws to his people. Now he will write his laws in them. He will give them understanding to know and to believe that his laws. He will give them memories to retain them. He will give them hearts to love them, courage to profess them, and power to put them in practice. This is the foundation of the covenant, and when this is laid, duty will be done wisely, sincerely, readily, easily, resolutely, constantly, and with comfort. A plentiful outpouring of the Spirit of God will make the ministration of the gospel so effectual 
that there shall be a mighty increase and spreading of Christian knowledge in persons of all sorts. Oh, that this promise might be fulfilled in our days. Amen. That the hand of God may be with his ministers so that great numbers may believe and be turned to the Lord. The pardon of sin will always be found to accompany the true knowledge of God. Notice the freeness of this pardon, its fullness, its fixedness. This pardoning mercy is connected with all other spiritual mercies. Unpardoned sin hinders mercy and pulls down judgments, but the pardon of sin prevents judgment and opens a wide door to all spiritual blessings. Let us search whether we are taught by the Holy Spirit to know Christ so as uprightly to love, fear, trust, and obey Him. Yeah, amen. <laughs> so, to whom was this promised? Um, in the verse, it says, to the house of Israel. And I was thinking, well, what about us Gentiles? Um, there's, a, there's another commentary called Gill's Exposition of the Entire Bible that addresses this, because in this verse, this verse is from the Old Testament. So he's saying, you know, I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah there in verse um, 8. And so what, how we believe that applies to us is, is stated very well by this um, guy named Gill. The persons with whom this covenant is promised to be made are the houses of Israel and Judah, which being literally taken had its fulfillment in the first times of the gospel through the ministry of John the Baptist, Christ, and his apostles, by whom this covenant was made known to God's elect among the twelve tribes. But being mystically understood, or spiritually understood, includes both Jews and Gentiles, the whole Israel of God, Israel not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Such as were Jews inwardly, God's elect of every nation. That's us. Okay, let's go forward to the. Yeah, there you go. The sign of the new covenant, the cup. So, what was the sign? Um, Matthew 26, 27, and 28 says, And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And then again in Mark, it's repeated, even with the word covenant in there. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. And then our third witness um, in Luke 20, uh, I'm sorry, 22, 20. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup is poured out for you, and is the blood, new covenant in my blood. So this is not repetitive. Jesus just said it once, but we have three witnesses repeating it to us just to make sure we get that. That's the sign. Um, so why the new covenant? Ephesians 2, 12 through 13 says, Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. All we like sheep have gone astray. In this new covenant, God lets us in on his righteousness. He could have left us dying in our sins, failing to keep the law. We couldn't keep the law, and the law didn't remove our sins. And he could have left us that way. His law was just and right and true, and we just weren't getting it. We weren't able to keep it. And he had every right to just leave us that way, but he didn't. He could have left us there, but instead he makes a promise obligating himself to place on us the righteousness of Christ if we only believe in him. So what's wrong with the Old Covenant? Quite simply, the Old Covenant, the law, would never take our sins away. It was necessary. The Old Covenant was necessary. And I, I thought of three reasons here that I believe it was necessary. There may be more that I didn't think of. Um, one, for us to see that we could never attain righteousness by our own efforts. Romans 3.19 says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. I think one thing the law does for us is makes us realize where we are as sinners. We see that we can't keep it. And so, that's one reason that we had to have the law. Number two, to show us that Jesus was under the law and was able to keep it. So I think, a lot of times we think, oh, there was no human that was able to keep the law ever. And there was. There was one human. He was also God. 
and he was able to keep the law. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. And then the third reason, coming off of the second one, that Jesus kept the law, and therefore Jesus was a truly sinless sacrifice. Hebrews 8.10 um, 10, 8 through 10 says, When he said above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. Then he added, Behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Once the new covenant was made, the old covenant was obsolete. If we stay under the law, we'll eventually die, just like if Noah had stayed in the ark, he would die. It was a necessary vessel, but only temporary. So, application. We got to this fast. Um, get out and stay out. Um, just like Noah's family and the animals had to leave the ark when its purpose was accomplished, we too must cease striving to gain righteousness by the law. As the Rainbow Covenant gave Noah the freedom to abandon the ark for survival, the New Covenant in grace gives us freedom to abandon the Old Covenant, which is law, for righteousness. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. When he says not your own doing, I'm thinking, it's not because you kept the law. You can't do this. And so, it's by grace. Application 2. I'm sorry if these applications are coming too fast. But, um, heed the signs. God has set a sign for the new covenant that we see in church every single week. Anybody know what that is? <laughs> okay, the, the cup of the communion cup. Um, no one was excited about the ark in Noah's day. Uh, until they realized they needed salvation from the flood. No one will be excited about the cross or the cup of the covenant until they realize they need salvation from sin. When we see a rainbow, we may or may not get excited about it. I mean, there is a video about that, but I mean, we don't usually think a it's a big deal. It's pretty, but it's not that big of a deal. But I can almost guarantee you when Noah saw a rainbow, that was a big deal to him because that was his, his guarantee of salvation from floods in the future. Um, so God has set this sign uh, for the new covenant, the communion cup of wine that we see in this church every single week. How can we see and be excited about this sign week after week? It can get to be kind of commonplace. You know, we take communion every week here, and you can just go up there and dip your bread in the wine and take it and, and not even think about it. But it is the sign of a covenant, and the covenant is really awesome. So one, each time you take communion, Ponder anew the meaning of the New Covenant. Think about what the real meaning is of the New Covenant. Let me read from Hebrews 8 again, uh, starting in verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, for I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. Our sins have been forgiven. Thank you, God. Number two, make sure you've taken advantage of the covenant for salvation by placing your faith in Jesus Christ. The scripture says that we can know God under this new covenant. You can actually know him. Under the law, the priests were allowed to go into the Holy of Holies once in a while, and you kind of stood back and the priest did your interfacing to God. Under the new covenant, we can know him. And number three, remember what you've been saved from. Having no hope and without God in the world. Think of those things when you see the cup of the covenant. This is the time for the response. Um, one more, there we go. We come to the time in our service where we respond to what God is saying to us or doing in us. Um, we'll have the opportunity to take communion, as we do, 
Please remember the sign of the new covenant as shown in the communion cup. Reflect on all that is yours, thanks to God, making the new covenant with you fully at his own expense. Um, number two, we'll have a chance to give. If you are a member of this church, you know where the giving box is. Let that be part of your worship experience this morning. And number three, we're going to do something a little bit different today, something new. Um, a couple of us will be standing by to pray for you. If you have a special need, um, either physical healing, spiritual healing, or just something you want to be prayed for, a couple of us are going to be standing over here. We're going to have the prayer room and the office available to us for a little bit of privacy. And um, just make your way over there if you would like to be prayed for. Um, last but certainly not least, we'll have a chance to sing our praise to God. Think of his covenant as you sing his praise also. Let me pray and then we'll, uh, we'll have a little bit of music while we get ready for communion. Lord, thank you for making a covenant with us. We know that you didn't have to do it and we know that you did it fully at your expense. And so we just thank you and praise you, Lord. We don't even probably understand the full extent of what it means. The cost to you and the gift to us, Lord. Broaden our minds this morning to understand that. How much it cost you and how much you gave us. And we just thank you for it so much. And we pray that you would keep us mindful of our new covenant on a daily basis. In Jesus' name, amen.